I'm so blessed to be with you this morning. Uh, it's a, such a joy to um, to come back here to Irvine and uh, uh, and be with your pastor Rajan and Indra and uh, let's see what God is doing here. Amen. I believe that uh, these are days of victory. These are days that we walk with God like never before, knowing fully in our heart that our Lord is coming back very soon. Amen. The great privilege that we have is that, you know, we are simple people. We are ordinary people. Uh, sometimes we are weak. You know, we wish we were stronger than we were. We wish we can do greater things that we could do. Uh, but we must always understand that because of who Christ is in our lives, the Bible says we can be more than conquerors. Isn't it amazing? You know, the Bible just doesn't say conquerors. It says more than conquerors. Last night, if you are here, I told you about Ephesians 3.20, where the Bible says, you know, Paul uses three adverbs to just explain to the church what a privilege it is to walk under the power of God. You know, he wants the church to know that if God's power begins to work within you, then your life is about exceedingly, Ephesians 3.20, exceedingly, abundantly, and more, right? More than you can ask. This is what the kingdom of God is about. For you and me who walk with Jesus, our life is about more than we can ask or think, okay? We have expectations that are good, but God wants to do way beyond our expectations, okay? We have dreams in life. God wants to do things that are way beyond our dreams in life. When God gave, a Joseph, uh, gave Joseph a dream, in that dream he saw his brothers bow down to him, right? He saw his family bow down to him. That was the dream. But he did not realize what that bowing down was, how it was going to be, what was going to happen. He never realized that a day will come in his life that he will be second in command in Egypt, right next to Pharaoh. He did not understand the position that God had for him. He did not understand the place at which God would, would establish him. He never understood what are the things that God would do in his own life? It's the same with everyone. You look at uh, uh, Saul. When Saul was looking for his father's donkeys, God had already chosen him to be the leader of a nation. Right? In himself, he never understood that. In himself, he never knew that. But the word of the Lord that came to him in 1 Samuel 10 was, uh, Samuel said, when the Spirit of God comes upon you, Saul... You will begin to prophesy. You will be turned into another man. You will do as the occasion demands. Verse 9, the Bible says, When Saul walked away from Samuel, he had another heart. Come on, church, are you with me? That's what the kingdom of God is about. The kingdom of God is about us moving way beyond where we are. When God anointed David through Samuel the prophet, David did not realize what was ahead of him. What was ahead of him was he was a warrior. He became one of the greatest warriors that Israel ever had. He became one of the greatest kings that Israel ever had. He became one of the greatest worshippers that Israel ever had. He was one person that God used to transform the whole nation of Israel. Come on, are you with me? What did the anointing also do? You know, we all know the incident with Goliath, right? You know, there's, you know, we sing so many songs about Goliath and all that, right? But, you know, the, 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 the incident about Goliath was not about just Goliath and the little stones to bring him down. God actually used that incident to show to the nation who their next king was. God used the situation of Goliath just to introduce to the nation of Israel who was the next who's going to be in command. Do you remember that? 
The Bible says the song in the mouth of the people changed. Saul killed a thousand. David, ten thousand. You see, God was actually introducing David and in the process was using a situation in the life of David to promote David. Do you know many times our challenges are not to defeat us. Our challenges are to promote us. Come on, are you with me this morning? Many times the giants of our life are to promote us, are to move us into the destiny that God has for us. If we are people who will begin to capture the value of the presence of God upon our lives, why does God anoint me? Why does God fill me with the Holy Spirit? Why does God do what he's doing in me? If we can capture it, you know, then we will begin to realize that our life is way beyond what we can think or imagine, right? When we look at the life of, of Joseph, the dream, when God gave him a dream, that's where all his problems began. Have you felt it? Oh, you know what? I try to get closer to God and I have a lot of trouble that comes up. Some people feel it's better to be a little, you know, a touch, a little touch and go with God because, you know, you can prevent a lot of problems from happening, right? You think about the life of Joseph. The minute he had a dream, he ended up, you know, getting the wrath of his brothers. You know, those who were his friends became his enemies. The wrath of his brothers. Then the next step was he was put into the pit, sold as a slave in a foreign country. In Fortifar's house. Had to go through temptation. And for no fault of his. Ended up going to the prison. In the natural. Every step was a step going down. Have you felt that? When problems come up. When challenges come up in your life. You feel things are going down. Things are going down. Why am I so challenged? I've heard many times people tell me. Pastor. But you don't know what I'm going through. You know I have so many issues. So many problems. Problems. Problems, problems, and every time problems are there, we feel we are going down. But do you know for Joseph, he got a dream? And what happened after he got the dream? In the spiritual, he got the wrath of his brothers. Went to the pit. Went to Fortifer's house. Went to the prison where nobody knew that he was there. And ended up going to the palace. The prison was one step before the destiny that God had for him. One step before the palace. Futifar's house was two steps before the palace. The temptation was three steps before the palace. The pit was four steps before the palace. Come on, are you with me? Let me tell you something. When you walk with God, you always walk in victory. When you begin to understand that your challenges are a step closer to the position and the privileges that you have in Christ, then you walk through them without any problems. You are bold. You can walk as an overcomer. Amen? Amen? One of the things that we must always know is when we are weak, God is always there for us. Let me read a familiar portion of scripture from Isaiah. The Bible says, verse 40, uh, chapter 40 and verse 28, Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. I love the scripture. You know, this is like a stage that is being set up before God wants to speak something into our lives. First, before he tells us something, he wants us to know who he is. Who is the one who's telling you something? Okay, so before we go to the next verses, Let's find out who this God is. What does, he, what does the Bible talk about him? Isaiah says, have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Okay. What kind of a God we worship? We worship a God who is, who cannot faint. Come on. Are you with me church this morning? God's in, in his dictionary, there's no word called faint. Okay? God does not know what it is to give up. 
God does not know what it is to get tired. He does not know what it is to get weary. If you look at the life of Jesus, you know, they did everything. They beat him. They spit at him. They abused him physically. They tore his back. You know, they, they, they said all kinds of things against him. You know, the man in authority who could have released him washed his fan, uh, hands off him. His disciples ran away. One of the best of his disciples, Peter, he denied him three times. He said, I don't even know who you're talking about. Can you imagine something like that happening? The best of your friends telling, oh, I don't know who he is. Does it hurt us? You know, sometimes we hear, you know, oh, you know, the people run away from us and we think what kind of friends we had. Jesus went through everything. But was he depressed? No. Was he weary? No. Was he, did he feel like giving up? No. Did he feel that, oh, you know, what kind of a people are these people? I, I did so much from them and they all ran away from me. Why? Because we have a God whose nature is different. And what does he do? He gives that nature to you and me. Come on, are you with me, church? What does he do? His nature he gives to you and me. Right? I, you know, uh, Galatians chapter 5, uh, we talk about, uh, Paul writes about the fruit of Holy Spirit. You remember? In 5.16 he says, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Then, you know, he talks about there's a conflict between the flesh and the Spirit. Then he talks about the fruit of the flesh. Then in 2021, he begins to talk about the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Right? Nine fruit of Holy Spirit. What are this? This is the character of Jesus. Come on, church. Are you with me this morning? That's the character of Jesus. And that's what Paul writes to the church and says, you can have the character of Jesus. It's the fruit. If you begin to walk after the spirit of God, then what will come out of you is the character of Jesus. Come on, let me just explain in a very simple way. Love. You know, this word, this word love is, is such a popular word in, word in the world today, right? Love, love. Everything is about love. You got to love, you got to love, 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 love. But for us as God's children, we know what true love is, right? The love of the world is a love by feelings. It's a love by emotions. It's a love by eros. It's an erotic love. There's a different kinds of love that the world has. But for us, we know another love. What is that love? Agape love, right? What kind of a love is that? Agape love. What love is that? It's an unconditional love. Okay? It's the love that is not based upon what I can get out of somebody. It's based upon what I can give someone. John 3.16, the Bible says, For God so, who initiated that love? God. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. We, we, got, we, we are not worthy of it. But the Bible says, For God so loved the world... That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth on him. All our part was to receive this love. Now what was the highest point of this love? Is Jesus on the cross saying. Father forgive them. For they know not what they do. Meaning I still love them God. He's telling the father. Father I love them. Love whom? The ones who broke me, the ones who hurt me, the ones who put me on the cross, the ones who betrayed me, the ones who spat at me, the one who even washed his hands off me. The one who even said to me, I don't know you. Ate out of my hands and turned their back to me. To them, the highest point of love is God saying, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. I still love them, God. That's the highest point of love. Now, Paul is writing to us about that love. What is that love? He says, 
if you walk after the spirit of God, what will come out of you is love. What is this love? Agape love. Are you with me? What is the love that comes out of us? Agape love. Right? So think about it. In a marriage between a husband and wife, your love for your wife is not based on what she can do to you. It's based on what you can do for her. Come on church, are you with me? What's that love? That's called agape love. My love for my husband is not because he proves to me he's my husband. Not because he proves to me he loves me. Not because he buys these things for me. It's because I just love him for who he is. Can your marriage break? No. Can you fight? No. Can you fight for your rights in your marriage? No. Do small things, you know, become big issues in your marriage? No. Why? Because you're not lo loving by feeling. You're not living, a li your married life is not based on why you didn't do this, why you didn't become this, why you didn't obey me, why you didn't, it's not about the why. It's about irrespective of who you are, I love you. Because I have now captivated the love of Christ in my life. I have understood that my life is about loving you the way Christ loved me. Love one another as, come on, what did Jesus say? He said, love one another as I have loved you. My love for you is not based on what you can do for me. When you love somebody, you love them because you love the way Christ loved you. Come on church, are you with me? It's powerful. It's powerful. That fruit of Holy Spirit is what God says can be part of you. It's my nature. I'm willing to give my nature to you. My joy. The joy that I give you. It's my joy. The peace that I give you. It's peace that passeth all understanding. I can be in peace even when there is storms in my life. What was Jesus doing when the storm was beating the boat? He was sleeping. Come on. What was he doing? He was sleeping. He could sleep in the midst of a storm. That was his character. That was his nature. The storm didn't bother him. The shaking didn't bother him. The effects of what could happen in the future because of the storm that's blowing, that also didn't affect him. What does God want you and me to have? The same peace. When the storms of life are up, you want to sleep. You can relax. Sometimes people can ask you, but aren't you worried? What will happen to you tomorrow? What will happen 10 days from now? What's going to happen to you two weeks from now? One month from now? You're not bothered. You're first telling them, excuse me, I have to sleep. Why? Because your peace is not dependent on what is happening around you. Your peace is centered about the God in whom you trust. Amen? Many times we allow circumstances around us to shape our lives. We allow circumstances to dictate to our life what we should do. Many times the money in our purse, the, 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 the money, it speaks to us. Have you felt it sometimes? Right? The best time is during offering. The minute the offering time comes, you open the purse, your $100 bill says, hey, don't touch me. This is for the whole week. Your $50 says, don't touch me. We need to go to the, the shop after the service. The $20 says, oh, you really need me. Oh, you know, it will speak to us. Five, ten dollars $10, no problem. They keep very quiet. Yeah? But the privilege that we have is God makes us a people where we tell our circumstances what they should do. Isn't it? That's the character of Jesus. He had so many challenges 
but none of the challenges dictated to him what he should do. Right? They are ministering, he and his disciples. There is a news that comes to him. What's the news? Lazarus, your friend, is sick. You remember that? He's sick. What is the reply that Jesus gives? He says, this sickness is not unto death. Come on. They, nobody's talking about death. First they're talking about sickness. Lazarus, your friend is sick. His reply is, this sickness is not unto death. What's the next thing that happens? He dies. And they wrap him. They do whatever they have to do. They carry him. And they put him in a tomb. If Jesus had the revelation that Lazarus is not going to die, would he have also had a revelation of what is going on there three day, in, the, in the next three days? Yeah, he heard. He was still ministering. Because in him, he already knew Lazarus was not dead. But after he said Lazarus was not dead, Lazarus died. Sometimes, you know, we speak faith, but when we speak the word, then things happen against that word. Have you felt it? Pastor, I prayed, but you know what happened? God spoke to me, but you know what happened? It went exactly the opposite. So what do we do immediately? We drop this down. This great faith and trust and hope that we have in God, boom, we put it down. What did Jesus do? He went. He went and then, you know, was that Martha that came to him. And he says, you know, um, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he is dead, he shall live. In her head, she knows that Lazarus is already in the tomb. So she says, yes, Lord, I know all that. We know that all of us will resurrect one day. Right? And what was he talking about? He already saw the resurrection because he knew that Lazarus is not going to die. To Christ, that dead body was still alive in his eyes. Come on, I want you to capture something this morning. Are you with me, church? To him, that situ in the midst of that situation, he still saw in the spirit Lazarus alive. When he went to the tomb, he didn't say, Oh, dead man, Lazarus, you dead spirit of death, go. Did he say that? No, he only called Lazarus. Laz he thought Lazarus. He called as though Lazarus was sleeping, sitting inside the tomb, you know. He just said, Lazarus, come forth. And what happened to the power of that word? If you turn with me to Isaiah chapter um, 55. Isaiah chapter 55. Look at verse 10. Okay, 8 and 9, God is speaking about your ways, not my ways, your thoughts, not my thoughts. As far as the heavens are high above the earth, so are my ways and my thoughts towards you. He is telling, you know, Isaiah is prophesying about how God has way, things way beyond our mind can grasp. Okay, in verse 10, what does God say? Isaiah prophesies, he says, as rain comes from heaven and water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud. That it may give seed to the sower. And bread to the eater. Now look at me for a moment. What is he saying? As rain comes from heaven. And water the earth. And. What does it say? Make. Do not return back. But. Make it bring forth. And but what happens when rain comes on the seed, something happens to the seed. That seed is a 
Simple seed. You keep it in your hands, it's a seed. You put it on your shelf, it's a seed. You put it in your pocket, it's a seed. Okay? Isn't it? But when you put it on the ground, and when rain comes upon that ground, that rain makes it bring forth and what? Ah, are you with me this morning? What happens when the rain of God comes upon you? What happens when the presence of God comes upon you? You are simple seed, you fall on the ground. John 12, the Bible says, unless a wheat, corn of wheat falls on the ground and dies, it remains alone. But when it dies, it brings forth much fruit, right? That's the same. When we are put on the soil and rain comes upon that, the rain is what does something to that seed. You know what makes your life productive? God. You know what makes your life, um, what do you say, uh, shine? It's God. What makes your life a life that can become something else? Like God said to Saul, you will be another man. What will make you another man? What will make you different? What will make you propel into the destinies of God is when the rain comes. When the rain falls on you, it makes something inside of you. And in here, God, you know, God is saying through Isaiah that you may be, you may give seed to the sower. You are only one seed, but you begin to give seeds to the sower and bread to the eater. And then verse 11, he says, so shall be my word that proceeds from my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish the purpose for which it is sent. Lazarus, come forth. That word does not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish the purpose for which it is sent. Now, understand this. That word is not based on the condition of the person to which it is sent. Amen. The resurrecting power of God is not based on what is the condition of the person. Oh, he had only fever. God said a word and he became okay. It's fine. He was dead. God said the same word and he came back to life. Do you understand? It's not about what situation you are walking in. Come on, church. I want you to capture it this morning. Why it is so important to receive God's word over your life is it's not about how intense your sickness is. It's not how intense your situation is. It's not how intense things are. My brother was telling me last night about a situation in his own life five, seven years ago, you know, an impossible situation. But with God, all things are possible. I know a man in India, a, a person in India, a beautiful family. You know, I, um, I was in the airport s several years ago, seven, eight years ago, uh, probably about, yeah, six, seven years ago. I was in, a, in the airport. Um, I, I checked in. I was, then I was living in India, checked in. I came to the security. I was sitting down waiting to board the plane. And I got a call from this family, beautiful family. They're still so close to my heart. And, uh, you know, the wife called me and she said, Pastor, uh, my dad is about to die. Okay? And she said, um, uh, you know, we've called for the ambulance, but, you know, his, he's become very quiet and all that. But we have quickly prayed with him. And, you know, he even prayed the sinner's prayer. And, you know, he received the Lord. But now he's become very quiet. And, uh, you know, it's may maybe just a matter of a short while before he will go to be with the Lord. So, uh, she said, I just wanted you to know, Pastor, before you left. So I said, uh, okay, 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 I'll be praying. And, you know, the minute she switched off the phone, it was about 2 in the morning. I just, you know, I just bent on my seat like this, closed my eyes and said, Lord, but what do, are you saying? And the word I heard from God was, this is not the time. I said, what? This is not the time. 
So I called the, the, the person again immediately, and I said, um, so, you know, where are you? So they said the whole family is outside in the living room. He's in the bedroom. We're waiting for the ambulance, but we don't know what's going to happen. So we're all waiting outside. So I said, please take this phone, put it on his ears. I said, just, put, just take the phone and put it on his ears. So they put the phone on his ears, and I said, Lord, according to what you told me, this is not the time. So in the mighty name of Jesus, whatever it is that is causing him to, uh, to die now, we rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Speak life into this body in the mighty name of Jesus. Prayed, and then, you know, after a moment, she came on the line again. She said, Pastor, I said, yeah, we've just prayed. I said, don't worry, God is in control. Nothing will happen. Today, it's seven years. He's still hale and healthy. He's taken baptism. He loves the Lord. And he is healthy. Every time I see him, he tells me, Pastor, I'm doing very well. I'm really okay. Hallelujah. That's the power of God's word. Amen. That word. So this morning, let me re read from Isaiah 40 again. The, the background is God saying that I'm not a God who faints. I'm not a God who is weary. Okay. And then he tells you and me something very important. He says, verse 29, he gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. What does God do? He gives power to the weak. Are you feeling weak? God is saying, I'm a God. He gives you power. The privileges of knowing Jesus as Lord and Savior is when you are weak, you can be strong. Come on, somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. The privilege is when you feel like giving up, you know there is a God who is ready to increase your strength. A God is saying, I'll make you stronger than how you are right now. Maybe your challenges are big. Maybe your challenges are strong. Maybe you're, you're difficult. You feel like giving up. But in the midst of that, there is a God who wants to walk right next to you and tell you, hey, my son, my daughter, I'm ready to give you power in your weakness. I'm ready to increase the strength in your life. Isn't it wonderful? In the world, many people don't know the, the privileges that they have when they come to need, know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Yes, firstly, he gives us eternal life that nobody else can give. Amen? Secondly, he takes away our sin. Whatever be the wretched sin that we have committed, he takes it out of the way. He washes us with the blood that he shed on the cross for our sins. Especially in these Lenten days as we meditate on the cross and think about the cross, we realize for the things that we have done with our hands, instead of our hands, it was his hands that were nailed on the cross. For the things that we think with our mind, instead of our head being, you know, put a crown of thorns, it was Jesus' sinless hand. For the places we go where we should not be going, instead of our feet, it was Jesus' sinless feet. He took our place on the cross. Why? So that we can have the privileges of who he is in our lives. When we receive him into our hearts as our Lord and Savior. He says, are you tired? I'll increase your strength. Jude 20 says, building yourselves up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Sometimes you might wonder why people speak in tongues and you know, why this tongues? What do you do? Jude writes, he says, when you pray in the Holy Spirit, when you begin to pray in the Holy Spirit, the Bible says you're building yourself up in the most holy faith faith. What happens to our lives? Our faith is beginning to grow. We begin to get stronger. We begin to build our inner man. Let me tell you this morning, God wants to increase our strength. God wants to increase the strength of our lives. He wants to turn our weaknesses around. He wants to turn our situations around. We are limited people, but our God is unlimited. When an unlimited God comes to live on the inside of me, what he does is he breaks 
my limitations and he takes me beyond my limitations into the unlimited possibilities of who he is. Come on, are you with me, church? That's what your life and my life is about. We're limited. Many times, you know, we tell ourselves, this is what I can do. Pastor, this is how much I can do. This is how much I can do. That's true. That's what we all think. But that's us. That's this brain. That's the little abilities that we have. But if we can believe God and trust God, and if we can say to God, Lord, take me beyond where I am. Take me into the unlimited possibilities of who you are. I always am challenged by Dr. Billy Graham. One man, one man who was willing to lay down his life for the gospel. Touched millions of souls around the world. One Reynard Banke, one man willing to lay down his life for the sake of the gospel was able to touch millions of people around the world. And let me tell you, my friend, the God that used Dr. Billy Graham and the God that used Dr. Reynard Banke is the same God that will use you. Same God. Same God. If we limit him, if we tell God, this is what I can do, God, then you have already put yourself in a box. But if you're willing, willing to surrender, willing to give up your personal limitations and say to God, God, I want more of you, God. You know, sometimes we try to balance God, you know, in our daily life. We try to balance God in our family life. I've heard people tell me, God first, family second, uh, ministry third. Have you heard that? Where, which gospel talks about all that? I don't know. Let me tell you this morning. You can never put God in a balance. This is human mind. We say God first, family next, ministry third, my children is fourth, my work is fifth. No, 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 there's nothing. God can never come in your one, two, three, four, five. God is way beyond of all of that. Amen? We try to pull him. We try to balance him, you know. We try to balance the things of God and the things of the world. We, we want to balance. There's no balance. You can never balance. You cannot put God on one side and stand on the other side. You can never do that. You can never put God on one side and put your family on the other side. You can't. God is the balance of our life. Can you imagine? If you want to live an effective Christian life, if you want to have a good family life, if you have, want to have a good work life, if you want to have a good prosperous life, God has to be above everything else. The Bible says promotion doesn't come from the east or west. It comes from God. The Bible says some trust in horses, some in chariots, but we trust in the name of the Lord. I share to you from Psalm 121. David says, uh, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help, it cometh from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He's saying, my help. I may have everything the world has to offer me, but my help, it doesn't come from the money I have. It doesn't come from the position I have. It doesn't come from who I am in this world. It comes from God. Let me tell you, church, this morning, our recognition is not because of who we are in the society. Our recognition is because of who we are before God. You walk with God. You put your knees down in your closet. You begin to experience the glorious presence of God. What happens between you and God inside the closet will be seen globally to the world around. At the burning bush, God told Moses. Moses said, Lord, how will they believe me? God said, put the rod down. What did it become? It became a snake. 
What did Moses do? He ran away. Why? I don't know why. Probably, I'm using the word probably. Probably because he knows the power of a serpent. For 40 years in Egypt, he had seen the symbol of a snake on Pharaoh's crown. Probably that was the stronghold of Egypt. God looks at Moses and says, go and pick up that snake. What does it become? It becomes a rod again. And God tells Moses, take the staff and go to Egypt. What was God telling Moses? You've already won the victory over Pharaoh here at the burning bush. Take your victory and go to Egypt. Come on, are you with me? Moses did not win his victory in Egypt. He won Egypt's victory at the burning bush. You don't win your victories because you know how to fight. You win your victories because you know how to kneel down in the presence of God. Come on, church, are you with me? It's the power of God. It's the power of God. When God's mighty power comes upon you, you will begin to walk in victory. That's the privilege that we have under the new covenant. God pours out his spirit upon us. God fills us with the Holy Spirit. The spirit of God. The Bible says we become the temple of God. Amen. We become, you know, what he has made us to be. Let me just quickly briefly say this and, and, and finish this morning. All of us know Romans chapter 7 and 8, right? Romans chapter 7 talks about, um, you know, how the law, the law has kept us in sin and how Jesus set us free. And Paul writes and ends up Romans 7 by saying, Oh, wretched man that I am, I do the things that I don't want to do. Those things that I want to do, I'm not able to do. You know? And he talks about that constant conflict and then talks about how important it is for us to understand that if we are people after the Spirit of God, then we walk in victory. Right? This is the privilege for us, church, under the new covenant. Let me quickly say to you, Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, the Bible says, Therefore there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So if you walk after the spirit of God, condemnation is out of you. Then he goes on to say, For the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. So when you allow the Spirit of God to reign and rule, you come under the law of the Spirit of God, then you are set free. Then he goes on to say, to be carnally minded is death, spiritually minded is life and peace. So we begin to understand that if my mind is spiritually minded, I begin to walk in life and peace. Then he goes on to say that we are called, those that are led by the Spirit of God are called the sons of God. Then he says, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. If that spirit works in you, then you know, we can live more than conquerors. Then he goes on to say that, you know, that uh, um, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by his spirit you put to death the deeds of your body, you shall live. He's talking about a life of walking in the spirit of God. Using the spirit of God to crush against the sin that comes to ensnare you. What do you do when you know that sinful things are coming your way? You use the spirit of God to crush it. You begin to pray against it. You go, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I come against it, Lord. Lord, you're praying against it. What are you doing? You are breaking the power of that evil over your life. Then the Bible talks about, Paul writes about adoption. He says how we are adopted as his children by the Spirit of God. So then we begin to also realize when you begin to walk according to the Spirit of God, you are adopted into the family of God. Right? To the point that you can call him Abba Father. Come on. Just like Jesus was able to look at the Father and say Abba Father, he gives by the Spirit of God, you become a person you can call and thereby you become co-inheritors of the kingdom of God. Come on, church, are you with me? Go back home and read Romans 8. You become co-inheritors. Like Jesus 
inherits the kingdom of God, you also become a co-inheritor. You begin to enjoy the same benefits that Jesus enjoyed. You begin to be a part of the same program. Amen? Then he goes on, Paul writes a little further down. He writes about, you know, how we groan in the spirit when we pray. Sometimes we don't have words to say, but you know, because we are so filled with the spirit, we are groaning. Oh, Rabbi. Oh, oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. You're pressing into the presence of God. That's a privilege that you have because of the spirit of God. Then he says, we intercede. By the Spirit of God, we pray into the will of the Heavenly Father. He who knows the mind of the Spirit. He's talking about God. He knows as you pray that, the, that God knows what is the mind of the Holy Spirit. And you pray into the will of God. You remember that? 25, 26. So what are you doing? Let's say for example, you know, I need to pray for Indra. Okay. I don't know. Maybe I don't know the situation. I can't understand the situation. I don't fully comprehend the situation. And I'm probably my words are limited. My mind is limited. I don't know how to pray. She needs prayer, but I need to pray to her. So what I do, I bring Indra before, before me and I, before the throne of God. And I say, Lord, oh, I pray for Indra, Lord. Because I don't have the words, but I'm praying. I'm interceding. What is happening? The Spirit of God is praying through me and praying the will of Indra through the prayer that I pray in the Spirit. That's the privilege. Come on, are you with me? You see how it's coming? It's like a river that's flowing. You know, no condemnation. No, the, 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 the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. The power of the law of sin and death is broken over me because I'm a man after the spirit of God. You know, now I'm led by the spirit of God. I begin to fight against sin by the spirit of God. I understand the power of God that raised him from the dead is the same power that is within me. I become a co-inheritor. I become the one that can call the same father, the father of Jesus. Today I can call Abba Father. Father, 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 I can speak to him because of what Jesus did on the cross for me. And because now I'm filled with the Spirit of God. I'm able to pray into the will of God. I'm able to intercede according to the will of God. Now, if we do all of this, then Paul writes in context, Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good. Come on, put that verse up, Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. Who are these people? The people that have begun to walk after the spirit of God. Understanding the spirit of God. Living according to the spirit of God. So now, because you're walking with the spirit of God, what's happening in your life? All things. Can you say all things? One more time. All things in your life are working together for good. Uh, are you walking in the will of God? Yes. Is what's happening around you the plan of God? Yes. Is God glorified in your life? Yes. Because you have walked the process. Then... Paul talks about five powerful things. Let me say that I'm going to finish. Then he says in verse 29 and 30, those he foreknew, he predestined. Those he predestined, let me read it. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. 29, 30. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. He's talking about five things. He says, when you understand that you are walking in the will of God, you have now come to the point in your life where you are now walking in the foreknowledge of God. Those he foreknew. Come on, are you with me? Are you able to understand that? You step into the foreknowledge. You understand 
that now you are in the right place. You are in the foreknowledge of God. To Jeremiah, you know, God said, in Jeremiah chapter 1, 3 and 4, if you read, 3, 4, 5, you know, God said, I called you a prophet even before you were formed in your mother's womb. What did God do? He already called Jeremiah to be a prophet even before he was formed. Psalm 139, I think it's 15 or 16, David writes, he says, he has a tremendous revelation. He says, Lord, you knew me in my unformed state. What is it? The foreknowledge of God. Then the Bible says, those he foreknew, Paul writes, he called. There's a calling upon your life. You are walking under the calling of God. Those he called, No, the, those he foreknew, he predestined. That means, first you are in foreknowledge, then you walk in the destiny. You know, you are come, you've aligned yourself into the destiny. You come under predestination. You know that, you know, God is leading you into the destiny that he has for you. After destiny, he says, those he predestined, he called. There's a calling upon your life. And those who are called, he justifies that means every step of your life, God is justifying you. He's justifying why he, you are doing what you're doing. He's justifying you by standing with you in every situation. And then finally he says, those he justifies, he glorifies. Amen? The glory of God will justify you. There will come a day when you stand before God. Well done. Thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. The glory of God. Come. Come into this beautiful glory. God glorifies you. Why? Because you have understood to live by the Spirit of God. You have allowed the Holy Spirit to take over your life. You are a man who walks with the Spirit of God. And because of that, all things in your life, you have come to that place where everything is now ordained by God. All things work together for good to them that are called by God, right? Called according to his purpose. And then he says, these people whose lives are in the hands of God, they've already come into the foreknowledge, into the predestination, into the calling, into the justification, and then finally into being glorified. Hallelujah. That's the privilege we have, church. Because we live in the last of the last days. Why I need the presence of God? Why am I saying, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit? God, I need more of you. Why are we saying, God, let the mighty presence of God be upon you? It's because there is a part. Just like Jesus walked on the face of the earth 2,000 years ago. The path that the disciples took for their lives was a path with Jesus. And what happened to them? They got into the foreknowledge of God. They were predestined, they were called, they were justified, and they were glorified. All things in their life worked together for good. Whether it was a storm, whether it was a, you know, being stoned, or whether it was being blessed, whether it was their traveling, wherever they went, whatever they happened, all things worked together for good in their lives. Until one day, they stood before God. And the privilege that you and I have today is, the Bible says in Hebrews, there's a great cloud of witnesses that stand before us. Amen? Today there is a cloud. There is a Joseph who's telling you, hey, if I made it, you can make it, man. There's a Paul that's saying, if I made it, surely you can make it. Amen? There's a John that's saying, if I made it, you can make it. There's a Thomas that's saying, if I made it, you can make it. As a cloud, there have been many people in the past who have gone before us, great men and women of God, who understood the calling, lived the calling, fulfilled, just like Paul. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept my faith. There are many who have done that. They are standing today and cheering at us as we are running our race and saying, hey, if I made it, you can make it. Just keep running. Run in the right direction. Walk in the right place. 
Hold on to God. Don't worry about what, what is around you. Just keep going. If we made it to heaven, you can make it to heaven.